Good day, nerds, and welcome to episode 104 of the Nerd Cantina Show. And today we have a, another Cantina conversation with our book reviewer, Megan McCarthy Bianc, and the three time returning author, Daniel Krause. And if you know Daniel Krause's work or have listened to the previous episodes, he has had a busy year. And this is his third time on the show. First one was for his book, Bent Heavens. And then he worked with the George A. Romero estate to complete The Living Dead. And now he is back to discuss his book, They Threw Us Away. All three of these books are very different. Uh, and this one is incredibly unique as it's a different st- telling of a book about teddy bears. I think think you're going to want to hear more about this story and pick it up as it releases on September 15th. This is a fascinating interview. I hope you enjoy. So we are here once again with Daniel Krause. We've covered his books on the Nerd Cantina, um, Bent Heavens, and uh, The Living Dead um, that he worked with uh, George A. Romero's estate. And so we're walking him back, third time guest um, with They Threw Us Away, which is going to kick off the Teddy Saga. Um, so thank you so much once again for coming out and uh, making some time in your productive year. Um, we really appreciate, you know, you coming back and, and you know, letting us pick your brain and, and offering something like a little extra layer to what you're already offering the world. Um, so thank you so much. No, it's my pleasure. It's like my second home now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's very, very honored. You know, whenever you, like I Steve was saying, like whenever you have anything that you got to pump out, just, you know, we're, we're happy to have you. So keep it coming, you know, with, within reason, but I'm sure you deserve a, you know, a much needed break next year at least. Yeah. I mean, this year has been wild with five projects out. Um, next year, uh, I think I just have one. I'm back to a, a regular nice. human being. And that's schedule. like, that's like normal for you, right? It's <laughs> just like, one yeah, book a year. I think one book a year is very normal. That'd be, a, yeah. that'd be, that'd be fast for a lot of people. Um, yeah. I think I uh, will inevitably have more than one thing out next year, but I think only one novel. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Cause I think I know you got, you just, um, so they threw us away is coming out September 15th. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And then I know that you've got a tunnel coming out. Too. Yeah, that's a more... couple weeks later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you are one busy guy, but we love it. Um, okay. So because we're, uh, you know, we're comfortable with each other now, um, you know, I feel like I will be a little more honest. So I don't know why I'm familiar with your work, um, the works that I've read so far that you kind of tend to lean towards like dark themed, mm. like my little hor- horror adjacent themes, like little suspense and thriller type um, novels. And um, I don't know why you, I thought you would tone it down for middle aged, mm-hmm. <laughs> middle school aged readers. And cause you didn't, it didn't seem like you just kind of like, uh, you know, you adjusted the reading level. <laughs> that yeah. was it. Like it was still kind of dark and scary yeah. and, you know, uh, eerie, like creepy. Like I didn't know that you can make teddy bears, teddy bears seem creepy, but you, yeah. you managed to do it. And then Rovina Kai's illustration was just like the cherry on yeah. top that like did, was almost perfect um so i have a couple thoughts on all of what i just said <laughs> like all the opinions i just said to you so why um so how did you what made you decide to jump from like young adult or adult audience to m- uh middle school grade um were you prompted did words with was it kind of like a thing <sighs> yeah. you always wanted to do it how was uh, it was neither of those really okay. it was um it, you know, in the same way that I don't usually think about young adult or adult before writing a book, um, it was the same situation here. Really, the stories just dictate where they go. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it wasn't like there was a a, a, a I hadn't made a check mark beside yeah. writing young adult <laughs> like that. Covering my bases in that way is is of no interest to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I did have the story that I'd been kind of toying with my brain for years, which is how I tend to tend to do it. Most of my stories kind of incubate for years, if not decades. And so for years, I was sort of, there was the seed of an idea of something to do with uh, teddy bears. Um, and once I, you know, once the pieces started coming together on it and I started mapping them out, it became more obvious to me that it was probably a book for younger okay. people. Um, just because that's kind of what the story dictated to me. Um, sure. But, but as you said, it's not, it wasn't, even in writing for this age range, it didn't change kind of who I am as a writer. Uh, and in, <laughs> in fact, in some ways, I mean, I think if 
I think one word you could apply to most of my stuff is kind of harrowing, whether or not it's a uh, horror or not. Yeah. Um, and I did find out rather relatively quickly, actually probably just in planning this before I even started writing it, that you can actually do things to teddy bears that you can't do to <laughs> human characters or animal right. characters. Right, okay. So in a way, you can actually be a little more uh, violent. I guess that's one way to look at it because, yeah, it was almost like... I, you know, I, I kind of like it reminded me as if it were like Toy Story with Buzz and Woody and the gang were in, in legit danger or if they just mm-hmm. were not lucky in so many other situations or if they straight up like instead of, you know, wandering around the suburban neighborhood, they were trying to yeah. find their way back home from like some inner city ghetto. Like, it, mm-hmm. you know, because some of the scenes are just kind of like, oh, my God, like they're well, you know, it's I'm not scary. I'm not super familiar with the Toy Stories movies. Um, I know I, I know I've saw I've seen in my life one and two at least. OK, <laughs> um, but I mean, that's when they came out. So it was yeah, ages ago. Yeah. Uh, but what what I do remember about them it, that it was very suburb, and that maybe maybe that changes in the sequels. I don't know, but it felt it felt very uh, safe in that sense. It mm-hmm. felt very sort of upper middle class white suburbs. Yeah, um, and that wasn't something I was interested in at all. Yeah. I wanted to do something that was very urban. Yeah, um, and I remember going back and forth with my editor about the part where the, uh, the the teddy bears have reached at least the outside of the city. And there's uh, a check cashing place and a, a liquor store and a, uh, a pawn shop selling guns. And he was kind of like, yeah, I don't know if we really want to get into <laughs> the existence of guns and liquor. Right, right. And I was like, no, we have to. Like, yeah. I, like, like this is this is daily reality. Like mm-hmm. there's, I, I live in a place like that and there are kids all over the place and they see check cashing places and yeah. liquor stores every single day. Yeah. Like, why would we, you know, why would you ever want to hide that? That's that's just the way cities are. Exactly. And it, it adds an element to like relevance, like where they can try to, the, you know, they can imagine the environment and if they're already familiar. And if not, it's kind of, you know, I think, you know, it's natural for adults to like kind of want to shelter kids. Like I have a, I have a three-year-old and I have one on the way and it's, you know, you kind of think about these things. And like, as I'm reading this book, I'm like, well, I have a 10 year old nephew. Like would I ever, would I let him read this book? And it's like, well, you know, why not? Like it's, it's different and it's, yeah, it's scary and it's eerie and it's creepy, but it's, I think kids, we have to give them more, uh, you know, we have to give them more respect than more, give them more credit to like absorb the world than I think what we want to. Yeah. I mean, I really trust kids in that sense. Like if it's too much, they'll, they'll, they'll put it down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and I, and I feel like at least when I grew up, there was, there was just so much kids stuff that, I mean, it didn't matter if you lived in a city and had never been outside the city. You had a sense of what it was like in the suburbs or mm-hmm. in sort of mm-hmm. upper class neighborhood. But I don't know that it's the other way around. I don't. I just feel like even now, there's not a lot of kid lit, for, especially for the younger set, like this book is, um, that really portrays city life in a way that feels legitimate. Like, where's right. all the where's the litter on, yeah. on the on the sidewalk and where's the, yeah. where's the trash piled everywhere. And just because it has those things, it doesn't mean it's bad. Mm-mm. It's just a different sort of environment. The, the people who live there, you know, they, they have limited ability to change that environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and the kids who live there certainly don't have the ability to change it. So, yeah. So the location of the, the Teddy saga from the trash, the landfill, the, 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 the junk yard to the city um, always was a really key component to it. Um, and, and in book two or three, they get, they get, you know, deeper and deeper into the the city until they're really in the center of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because that, that cliffhanger was just like, I don't know. I, it didn't make me mad. It was just like, I I remember like when I was reading, it it was like almost every, um, maybe every other chapter, not every chapter, but I was just, my jaw was dropping a little bit. Like, wait a second, how, where does, where does he get off? Like you're writing this creepy shit for 12 year olds. But I just, I I couldn't, I almost couldn't put it down because it was so intriguing. I think that's like the beauty of it because you wanted to do something different and it's like, it offers something different. And I think that's definitely going to like, you know, resonate with, with the audience that it's intended for as well. Yeah. I mean, I have no doubt that there will be um, adults who aren't going to approve of this. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm not worried about the kids. I'm never worried about the kids. In my long history of writing uh, inappropriate books, I have never, <laughs> never once 
received a single note or letter from an unhappy kid or teen uh, ever. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there will be adults and parents and librarians who think this too much, but I, I can, I'm not in control of them. I mean, it's already uh, I, published. What are they going to do? Like, yeah, I would have loved this. <laughs> I would have loved this as a kid, you know, because yeah. you think you think you've seen it. Like you think you understand what these kind of books are. Then it's like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to wake up a little bit, you know, in a way, in a way, this kind of feels to me like a different twist on something like the, um, Corduroy. Remember Corduroy mm-hmm. wakes up in the store. Yeah. Like I always found that as a kid, really spooky. Yeah. Um, he's all alone in this dark store. Uh, that, that scared me a little bit as a kid. And this is kind of an extension of that. Um, kind of taking it the other way. Like yeah. wait, I, he remembers being in a store, like what happened? Yeah. 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 So this is, in a way, this is sort of my take on Porter, <laughs> I guess. Taking uh, it one to the next level. Like. But I, I mean, I do think the book is quite sweet, though. Um, I, and maybe I'm just demented and it's not sweet at all. But <laughs> but, I, but I think that the characters are, are cute and... Um, they are, lovable. but it, yeah, it's the way that you present them because you're just like, well... It could have, they could have been falling for a day or for, you know, ha- six months. Like, teddies are no good at time. And yeah. so, like, it's like with little things like that, you're just like reminded of, like, oh my, it, yes, it's adorable. And yes, it's kind of a way to like remind the reader, like, okay, yeah, this isn't like for kids, you know, this is for teens trying to find their way back or, you know, trying to figure out what happened and how to make it right. It's like little teddy bears. And, mm-hmm. you know, where they, they remember where they're supposed to be. They, you know, they're kind of going through this like existential crisis and and yeah. you know it's but yeah like little things like that where it's, it's you kind of remember like oh holy crap like it's and it is taking a step further because i'm like i'm reading this and i'm thinking like you know so what did um it brings me to one of my questions so like what what would you you kind of i guess you kind of touched on this before with a, a previous conversation but what would you Cause, cause so all the teddies, they have like very distinctive personalities and Mm -hmm. they, you know, those actions based on those personalities. And so, um, you know, what, what were you kind of, and then they put in these situations where buddy has to make some really difficult choices where he has to like be brave and he just has to like be, he's he's reminding himself that, you know, this is what a good leader would do. And so Mm -hmm. like, what kind of like, what were you hoping, um, you know, that readers, this, this age group would kind of like get out of these out of out of this book or at least the first installment in the series well i mean for this sort of casting the uh the book was a little easier than than normal in the sense that i just wanted some strong personality there was sort of action oriented teddy and the more uh, philosophical quiet teddy yeah. <laughs> and, and so forth um i I don't really think about it in the, in the terms of what are they going to get from the the individual characters, but I do I do think that there's something to get from the the group of them together. Sure, um, sure, yeah. Uh, I I I do want to sort of present a message of um, that terrible thing can happen to you uh, just as they happen to the teddies, and you can kind of go through these various traumas and then still be okay. You know, yeah. still have a have a group that supports you, and um, th- there's a lot in this book and in this series about the teddies not feeling worthy anymore because mm-hmm. they're getting dirty and they're falling apart. Yeah, and they're they're they think they're becoming less worthy in the eyes of children who might want to right, have right. them. And so, but by being alive, this thing that they're not really supposed to be, they're finding that they have a self worth that's not a reflection of what somebody else wants yes. from them. And that's that's yes. the, the natural toy default is your love because a kid loves you. But maybe if you you've lived just a little bit, you find that you're you're lovable because of just who you are and your your friends. And it's it's more of an interior. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's just not, you know, cuz they're they're presented with these difficult situations and then how they come out of that and you know, at the end cuz there's so many like I don't know. There's there's a lot kind of creepy situations too, and kind of scary. Where it's like, I don't know. You know, you're reading it as adult, and it and it's like, well, we're humans. It's like that's us doing, you know, controlling this environment essentially. But then it's like you see it from that other side, and and it's yeah, it's exactly that. It's like where it flips it back on the character, like you were saying, where it's you know they're attributing their worth, like they know that they can only have to they have to find the loving arms of a child and that's like mm-hmm. the end goal. And then like for the forever sleep and, um, and then there, 
you can see like you can sense they're kind of freaking out because they're yeah. like we have to find children like you know let's find the place with the golden hills like, or the yeah. yellow hills or whatever like that's where children are and that's where we have to we go to the store and like that's where the children will be and and it's it was almost sad but you're like still rooting for them you're like oh my god i hope they find i hope it's all okay and but it's like yeah it's kind of sad where it's like like oh my gosh like you know they're just chasing this affection. They're chasing this love. They, right. That's that's how they know that they have meaning or and that's, that's like their th- purpose. I think that's like a kid's point of view. Like, like you think, you know, you're chasing affection from other people, your parents or, or whoever. Um, but what the teddies are sort of start to go through in book one and certainly more into the other books, um, they, they start wondering whether or not this goal of finding forever sleep with a uh, child is really what they want. You know, uh, now that they've lived a little bit, uh, do they really want to just go to sleep? Like mm-hmm. this life is scary, but it's kind of exciting too. Yeah. I think that mirrors a kid sort of growing up and seeing that, well, it, it is scary out there on my own, but I kind of want to do it anyway. Yeah. It's yeah. Cause you sense, you see it as like, it's like, you gotta, you know, you gotta go through some, some tough shit to like grow. You have to like, and then after that, you just become like more confident and more comfortable in yourself and in the world. And like, I mean, I mean, I'm reading this as like someone in my early thirties. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Like, you know, like I've done things where I've been in situations where I'm like not familiar with, and I have like little to no experience, but it's like, no, that's exactly right. Like, because I came out after I did it, I came out like that much more confident and that much more familiar. Like, even if it was something, you know, maybe not that serious, it was like, well, no, like, well, I can handle it. Like, I know for sure that I can handle it now. And it's, yeah, like from the eyes of a kid where, you know, they're just, they're absorbing, especially like ages 10 to 14 with with these readers, Mm -hmm. uh, this age group, it's, yeah, they're, there's so much going on. They're, they're, their brains are sponges for so long. And, and um, in addition to them, their brains still developing. And then, you know, to kind of putting it, putting it into this context of the teddies, like venturing out into this world that they're never, they were never supposed to be in, but then they're kind of, um, they're doing okay. Like they're yeah, still, I, I do, cause they've got each other. And, I do wonder if, if uh, this book will be actually less worrisome to kids than it is adults. Like, I think it's written at, and purposely at a certain uh, pitch that, um, you know, adults can certainly read it too and get something mm-hmm. out of it. In the same way you might read like um, Neil Gaiman's Graveyard Book or something. Like like there's, k- kids can read it, but adults can get something out of it too. Yeah. And I wonder if it's it's possibly more disturbing of a story for adults because they're a, sort of aware of what, what these steps of growing up mean and sort of aware of the the in this sense, very literal loss of innocence because the yes. teddies are born completely innocent. Yes. Means, whereas if, if you're a kid just reading through it, it might just feel like a more organic um, series of events with protagonists and just being kind of led through it. I don't really know. Uh, we'll see. I mean, if, yeah. if, there's, <laughs> if there's like a generation of kids scarred by this book, I, I guess I'll hear about it. I don't know. I mean, I think this age group growing up in 2020 right now with everything going on, I think, um, I think, um, you know, this, this story is the least of anybody's yeah. worries at this point Yeah, that's <laughs> with everything of, else that they've had to go through this year. That's I, all, you know, I, I always end up back there. It's like at the end of the day, like, like I'm not worried about it. Like these yeah. are books that kids, you know, aren't being generally aren't being forced to read. Like they got a lot of worries that are a lot more than than this book about teddy bears. Like exactly, if they exactly. if this is meaningful to them, they will latch on to it. Yeah, no, it, I I really enjoyed the book. Um, what was your favorite? So, what did you enjoy the most? I'll do this. Will be a two part question. What did you enjoy the most about writing for this age group? But then, then what was like mm-hmm. the most challenging part of it? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, the most challenging part, surprisingly to me, was getting all the rules down and uh, rules of like the Teddy world and, and what they uh, not only their sort of larger mythology, but also just sort of what can they, how do they experience things? Can they feel, can they taste things? They can, but like, these are answers I had to come up with. Yeah. And I think I, I skimped over a lot of those answers at first. I thought I could skim over them in a, in a lighter way than I typically do, but I couldn't. And my editor really caught a ton of, um, sort of contradictions uh, in my original draft where it's like, well, you said Teddy can't do this, but they're doing this. (laughs) 
Um, or they're doing something dig like sometimes I'd be really strict about what you could or could not do with a teddy bear body, but then other times they would be, you know, expertly tying knots with like with, right. you know, with their teddy bear paws. And I was like, well, right. I have to account for some, or at least explain how difficult it was. So there, so that was surprising to me. I had to go in more detail there than I had expected to do. Yeah, like a little um, physics of it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So at some points, I was really good about it. And some points, I just like ignored it. And so I had to fix yeah. all that. <laughs> as far as like what I enjoyed about it, I mean, I really did like the swiftness of it. You know, like I think I was writing this generally between drafts of The Living Dead, which is, um, you know, couldn't be more different. It's just this sure. gi- gigantic, dense uh, adult book. And to be able to to sort of cleanse my palate with this very, very swift moving story, I think that's that's been fun, you know, and mm-hmm. it has continued into book two, uh, which is in editing right now, but pretty close to done. And then into the planning for book three, it continues to be interesting to me and a little bit analogous to the work I've started doing in graphic novels and comics in where you just have to kind of get to the point more quickly, uh, which is kind of goes against my natural style. I sure. <laughs> I tend to be a little more Baroque in uh, my language and sort of pace. Yeah. Um, so, so that's all been an interesting experience. But you're saying that's like you, you enjoyed having to kind of, yeah. it was, even as a challenge for you, but it was a good challenge for you, <clears> you <throat> to kind of like dig in and, and, and think, kind of remind yourself who, who you're writing for. Yeah. I mean, Kind of. I mean, the, as far as like the pitch of it, um, I don't think I've had too much trouble with that. Um, I've read enough. Uh, I used to be a, a book reviewer and I would review everything from picture books, middle grade books to okay. adult books. So I have a, a decent background in middle grade books. So I think I inherently sort of n- know kind of the level the writer yeah. should be at. Uh, so that that wasn't the biggest part of the challenge. Um, it's it was just like a breath of fresh air, like, because you would yeah. almost like take a break from the living dead. Yeah, I really, so. I really, really thrive on um, that. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. working on a bunch of things that are very different. Yeah. Uh, I think it really helps all the projects when being alternated projects that are very different. If it's right hand in hand with the way I consume media, which is, yeah. um, you know, just as broadly as possible. You know, I read and watch every genre of uh film and movie and book like i just try to read it doesn't matter if it's horror or romance or westerns or whatever i just i want as much input from different areas as possible yeah i think that's you know that helps the brain either kind of wake up or you know stay you know it keeps you on your toes and it keeps your brain sharp in a way where it's you're not getting bored you're not consuming like the same type of material and you kind of can bounce back and forth and your brain is like consistently paying attention to what's yeah. going on. I often think about people who write, you know, who are on their 14th book in a series <laughs> or something. And I, I abstractly, I sort of get it. Like I, I kind of think there would be something interesting in just ever drilling downward into the same world. Like, can you make that continually interesting? I'm guessing you usually can't and you're <laughs> making money, but right. But, but, uh, but I'm sure the, the good ones of those type of series do find ways to just keep mining. And, and that's fascinating to me because that's its own kind of challenge, mm-hmm. but I'm much more inclined to, um, to not do that at all. I think, uh, I think that's one of the things, you know, being raised on like many people my age, being raised on Stephen King, you know, he wasn't a series guy. He, sure. Uh, oh no. Yeah. He just wrote, and now as an adult, in retrospect, I can look back and say, oh, well, he actually wrote kind of a, it seems, a, a yeah, limited. I think like a theory of like a universe or something. Like a yeah, multiverse but, but he, something it's like not that. like he was like super like mixing it up. Like it was all mm-hmm. in comfortable Stephen King land, basically. Right, right. Uh, most of it. Um, so I'm trying to be, you know, more broadly minded than that. But but certainly that was an early inspiration that really led me towards individual books um, and I've never been much of a, a deep series reader. I can't think of anything offhand that I followed more than three books. Yeah. And I think, you know, that you also don't want to drag anything on too long. Cause then it's like, you almost want to like, you know, 
you kind of want to end it when it's at its greatest because in the longer yeah. you run a series, like even if in film or TV or, or uh, literature, you know, I think the longer you run, the more risk you get of like, you know, getting dry, you know, getting worse. And, you know, yeah. and then that, that's the kind of the lasting legacy that you leave unfortunately versus if you would have just ended it like maybe after book yeah. three or four. I, I mean, again, know. I'm because I, I thrive on challenging myself. I, there's, there's something about that that's appealing to me. Like, having to work in the same territory over and over again. But um, it's, I think it's, <laughs> I, yeah. I want to branch out more broadly. Yeah, no, and it, you know, absolutely. As long as you're like honest with yourself and you're, you know, and who knows, maybe some down, down, you know, somewhere down the line in your career, I don't know if you, you would ever consider like revisiting something or maybe you could skip this idea where you're like, oh shit, like I'm going to go I have, with it. Yeah. I have. Re- I mean, the series that I've done, I, Zebulon Finch was two books and the Teddy Saga is three books, but they were, okay. they were conceived at once though. Yeah. Okay. You know, it wasn't like I wrote one and thought, all right, I'm going to capitalize on that right now. They were, they were front to back stories that just broke up in certain mm-hmm, chunks. Mm-hmm. I have thought about, um, Going back to Rodders, um, uh, which is still one of my most popular books, my second book. And every once in a while, I, I, I know what that book would be if I ever wrote it. Um, but really, that's, you know, I've written They Threw Us Away as my 11th book, I think. And really, that's the only one that I, I think about going back and adding to. So it's yeah. just, not, okay. just not my... There's too many stories I want to tell. Yeah, yeah. That I the idea of going back... And it's just, it feels like wasted time to me. Yeah. Because you're, yeah, you're probably eager to get all these other ideas. Out yeah. I mean, I'm definitely yeah. at that stage where I feel like I, well, I don't feel like I know that I'm not going to get them all written. <laughs> right. You know? So I've got to, I've got to move you're fast and prioritize. be yeah. judicious about what I want to do. Yeah. So did you, um, did you work at all with, Rovina Kai, like how, what was that process like of, of working with an illustrator? Um, do, how much, you know, uh, collaboration was there, you know, what, you know, and yeah. how did that kind of differ from uh, your other work? This is really the first time I've worked with an illustrator, any kind of real way, both troll hunters and shape of water had some illustrations, mm-hmm. but they, they weren't incorporated in the manner that this, is. um, the, the interaction is, is pretty minimal, really. It's really a matter of me and my editor going through the book and, tagging ideas for certain um, illustrations so sort of highlighting pieces of text and saying this might right, be Right, like choosing like, what, yeah, yeah. And then Ravina then would sort of have her input on that and say, you know, if there were three spots highlighted in a chapter, she might say, this is the one that I could draw the best. Right. And then she goes, goes through and does a pass that are just sort of quick sketches. Um, and then, you know, the editor and I say, yep, that looks great. And then she does the finished work. So it's, I think there's probably a lot more back and forth going on between her and the editor sure, than, sure. than I am privy to. I'm sort of there at the beginning, then I'm sort of there to sort of okay things along the way, but it's not an intense um, yeah, interactive relationship. Not like highly collaborative, just kind of like picking each other's brain and, you know, yeah. getting to the juicy parts and really knowing kind of like, you know, I almost like on a need to know, but, you know, in a creative. Yeah. And, and certainly I was a, I was definitely heavily involved in choosing her. As oh, okay. A, as yeah. I was going to say, yeah. how did that, how did that go on? So it's when you, you know, you said earlier that you were, uh, you know, drafting this idea, you were coming up with the story and then you realized somewhere along the way that it, it should go, you, mm-hmm. you know, it should be for a younger audience. And so at which point did you decide like, Oh, I should, you know, what if I added this like illustration element to it? Um, that, that I didn't worry about at all. Like I just sold the project, the trilogy, and then talked to the editor about, you know, should this have illustrations? Okay. Both sort of agreed it should. And then, you know, we both mostly him gathered a bunch of samples of artists that we liked and then narrowed it down. And then, you know, and then it's, it's not a sure thing. They'll want to do it. So then you, you know, sure. then you approach Ravine or he, or my editor does and say, you know, here's this thing, read it. See if you want to be. Yeah. So, did you have have to have a couple backups then too? Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure she was our first choice, but uh, yeah, you always have backups. Yeah, mm-hmm. I started following her on Instagram, and her style it was like just perfect for yeah. this book and for the the mood and the vibe of the story. So, yes, she's got a great mix of uh, whimsical style that still has uh, kind of an intrinsic darkness to it, but nothing overwhelming. Mm-hmm, it's all mm-hmm. at the same time. It's all very pretty. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's no, I just remember like just even some of the illustrations I was looking at. And and that was just one thing that I was really curious about. I knew I wanted to find out more how that process went because um, it was just it, it, the match, the match seemed too perfect for, for the story and for the mood and, and yeah. her style. And the yeah, fact she really, that yeah. she really got the mood and it's, yeah. she's really great at animals. Like that was one of the things that was really attractive about her art is that she's just second to none when it comes to wolves and whales and birds. And so we figured she would probably also be pretty good at teddy bears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if she wasn't, then she is now, she's yeah. had plenty of practice with the, and then she'll be, um, oh, I'm imagining she's going to be part of this project for the next few books too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. I know I really enjoyed her, um, her pairings to go with it. Um, so I'll just look through my notes here. Oh, uh, which, which Teddy do you, do you, did, do you think you related to the most? Huh. <laughs> um, I think probably, boy, I got to think about this because <laughs> I relate to all of them to some degree. Sure. Um, I mean, my, it, the I don't I don't really want to give the answer that I I'd like to give almost any answer rather than the one I'm going to give because I I think it would be kind of cooler to to see myself as Sunny or Reginald even, but honestly, I feel a little bit more like Buddy. Um, I feel like for various reasons in my life, I've had to kind of be the, the leader of various things, instigator. And that's, you know, not always a comfortable spot to be in. Um, yeah. and there's a lot of responsibility with that and it's kind of less fun. I think, I feel like Buddy's <laughs> probably having the least fun of everyone. In the yeah, book. probably other than what was it? Horace. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> Hor- Horace was not having a good time. No. Um, <laughs> So I, I feel like the the weight that Buddy carries is feels familiar to me, um, but I certainly uh, you know Reginald, Sonny, and Sugar. I, there there are things I um, relate to in all of them certainly. Yeah, no, I I was just like you know just reflecting on it, thinking of like all these different um, personalities that you that you fit into these like little little cuddly toys, and um, you know I remember one thing I write writing in my book reviews. You know what somehow you made. Uh, you know, you made teddy bears seem relatable <laughs> in one yeah. level or another. And um, I know that's always, that's usually the goal in any, um, any of your work, I think characters at relatable on some sort of level. Um, and it was, you know, it was no different than, um, you know, with, with this age group and with, with these types of characters. Um, so I do want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to ask one more okay. um, kind of obviously trying to be spoiler free. So what can we look forward to in um, number two, three? Uh, two is a, a bit of a departure, really. Um, they are going to, the teddies are going to get waylaid somewhere. Okay. They're going to end up, <laughs> they're going to end up somewhere they did not intend to yeah. go. And they're going to be caught up in a, a sort of, um, I'm being very vague on purpose in a sort of group. Um, there's, Number one is very much a road story. They're on the road. They're moving. Number two is more of a story about um, sort of a, a, a mass, you know, a mass of characters. Okay. And how somebody, how sort of a young, growing person would relate to a crowd and become part of the crowd or stay outside of it. So it's, a, it's an entirely different sort of thematic thing that's happening. Um, and it, it largely takes place in one location. So there's, there's a kind of screech to a halt as far as the travels go. Um, and then book three is more of a travel, more back on the road again, but three is sort of where all the stops get pulled, you know, and, uh, um, I'm really interested about how people are going to take number three. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would say if you thought one was troubling, wait till you get a load of two and then wait till you get a load of three. Uh, um, but, it, but again, um, I feel like just on a chapter by chapter progression, it's, it's going to make sense and it's going to feel legitimate. I don't think any of the things that I make them go through or feel um, like... <laughs> over the top like i don't feel like they are i feel like they're okay. they're uh they're fairly organic and they're all following a trajectory you know, I, yeah. am, I am the teddies are sort of maturing yeah as they have to do it in sped up time because they start 
they started knowing nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're, they're maturing as a, as a kid would except kind of on a faster scale. Yeah. So they're going to, they're going to cycle through the various touch points of, of growing old, growing older and, you know, losing their innocence in that, if you want to use that kind of weird term, um, and, you know, doing things that they shouldn't do and, you know, becoming more complicated characters and not, always in in good ways but in some good ways yeah you kind of touched on that um in book one too where they were kind of uh where they they were going a little too far uh yes in one situation and it was um you know that was definitely a scene where it was like okay no that it's this journey is starting to get to them and they're starting to get frustrated but that's also you know that's part of being a kid too is just working out even as an adult, you're just working through these situations. You're working through these yeah, your horrible things. And, and, you, la- and you lash out and you mm-hmm. hurt people and yeah. you, you do things you shouldn't have done. Yeah. And, that's and some it. of them, some of them you can't take back. No, absolutely. And um, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to number two and number three. I didn't know what to expect. Like I said, like I thought, oh, he's writing for a younger age group. Maybe he'll, this one will be less creepy or less, you know, horrifying. <laughs> I was like, I was wrong, but it, you know, it's, you're a great writer. Everything is beautifully written and you still have got that, all those lessons to be learned and all those things to consider, um, you know, and, and the road, the road to growth and the road to, yeah. you know, figuring things out and making choices and having the consequences too. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. And I hope people take a chance on it. Um, it next, next to Zebulon Finch, it's, uh, it's my favorite plot. Like the the three book um, story is, I think one of the most satisfying stories I've ever put together. Uh, it's one that there's there's clues throughout of how it's all going to end, and I think all the pieces come together in a a really satisfying way. Um, I'm not going to say what emotion I want to be elicited by the okay. satisfying way, but I think <laughs> I do think they come together in a way that is is unexpected but but logical. And do we and so do we get more of the backstory too? Of the originals, yeah, and proto. yeah, okay, yeah. So that's going to, um, well, I'll just say yes. You, will. <laughs> that's a good answer. Because <laughs> I know I remember thinking like, like you know, oh, we're, we're this is not the end. We're going to see more of of this of Reginald's, you know, uh, memories or knowledge. If what, however, if they come to him because he doesn't know what the story is going to be until he's done. And um, so I guess I don't know really know what to call it. It's not memories, but it's just. Yeah, knowledge. it's sort of like collective Teddy knowledge of where they came, <laughs> they came from. Um, yeah. So that that story, the, that backstory will eventually um, kind of finish in a way. So you have the complete, yeah, complete backstory. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, sure. both, you know, third time, third timer here. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, the number two and number three and um, best of luck also on uh, releasing the, the autumnal. Cause mm-hmm. is that, is that your first graphic novel that you're collaborating uh, on? Uh, com- it's a comic book, but um, right. okay. yes, my, my first one. Yeah. Okay. That's, this has been a big year for you, and what a year it has been. Yeah, I know. I picked a doing all this. <laughs> picked a questionable year to have five projects come out, but no. But you know what? I you know when I speak to authors about releasing a, a title, even you know, I feel especially um, for the when it's first time authors, it's their debut novel, and they're mm-hmm. debuting their first published work during this crazy time too, where they're forced to do a lot of press. You know, that's outside of the norm. Um, of how these things go. And I think, you know, when I talk to them, I'm like, you know what, like, if, if you being busy is a way for you to like, you know, cope and either producing or consuming yeah. art, I think for a lot of us to like cope or have some, you know, routine or some regularity, something, some familiarity when there's so much uh, unpredictable, like circumstances, uncontrollable circumstances going on, like, whatever you need to do to like keep your mental health in check. Like I'm, I'm just total advocate for, and one way or another, you know, if, if that means you're giving people like me more stuff to read and other, you know, people like you more stuff to like, you know, to get out and to flesh out, like you Mm -hmm. just do what you got to do. It's like, it's like, you know, it's almost like screw it. Like do what you got to do at this point. Yeah. So yeah okay but thank you so much we'll let you go i really appreciate it um yeah no problem 
Yeah, and we'll look forward to uh, more of your published. Yes, I look forward to coming back for a f- record yeah. break, record breaking <laughs> fourth time. The reigning champ. Yep. <laughs> thank you. And thank you very much for listening to this Cantina conversation. As always, we're going to encourage you to go over and join us over at thenerdcantina.com forward slash community and give us a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Every bit helps. We hope you join us next week for the recapping of the week's nerd news. But until then, talk to you later, nerds.